Okay, so welcome to everyone listening now and in the future. This is the Mindful Embryo with Yap Vanderwall. This is a free talk in preparation for our two-day seminar with the same name, the Mindful Embryo with Yap Vanderwall at the end of July. So it is very kind of you, Yap, to be sharing with us uh, for this free talk. And I'd like to just to introduce you. Yap Vanderwall. PhD, MD, is a physician and, and until his retirement in 2012, he worked as an associate professor of anatomy and embryology at the University of Maastricht, the Netherlands. After his medical training in 1973, he specialized in functional anatomy of the postural and musculoskeletal system with later emphasis on the architecture of connective tissue and fascia and its role in proprioception. Gradually, he developed as a teacher in the philosophy of science and in medical anthropology. My passion, however, was and still is human embryology. The human body is a process that develops and functions over time. The embryo moves and behaves and forms. It is in this area that I came across Goethe's phenomenological approach. I apply the method of dynamic morphology to understand what we actually do as humans when we are embryos. I respectfully find in the embryo tentative answers to questions about the significance of human existence. After his retirement in 2012, he has devoted himself entirely to Dynamension, a worldwide project to teach embryosophy. Check out his website at embryo.nl. Why don't you go ahead and start, Jan Vanderwall? Okay, thank you, Kate all that introduction. Um, good evening, because the place where I am now in Maastricht, the capital of Europe, it's nearly evening. And um, I would like to say good evening, everyone. Uh, since it's no longer woke to start your courses with good evening, ladies and gentlemen, I try to avoid your word everybody, because I don't like to talk to everybody. I don't deal with bodies. I deal with people, and people are mind and body. So I prefer to say good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Maybe you don't know me. Some of you I recognize from courses that I have given. Yes, I give courses about the embryo in us. That's right. That are uh, four-day seminars all over the world. And um, I used to do that... Uh, also in America, but there's a good reason not to do that anymore. So I introduced with Kate a two days webinar about the main topics, the main items of that uh, cool. seminar, the embryo in us. On, in those two days, we will focus on, you know, the typical prenatal and perinatal public. That's not uh, the main portion of my public that I usually attract with those courses. I attract osteopaths, cranial sacral therapists, uh, Qigong people, anthroposophists, medical doctors, midwives. There's a wide broad public that is interested in my courses, the embryo in us. And why is that? I think that I address my courses mainly to people who are like me, searching for spirit, the spirit in us, the dimension in us that makes us what we are. And it is nowadays a problem to rhyme, you know, the acceptance of us being people, persons of mind and body, to rhyme that with science. And that is my main, my main goal, to bring people to, to give people the message and the trust that you can rhyme with each other, the natural science that talking about our body nowadays with the concept or the belief that we also are beings of spirit and matter, that we are beings of soul and body. There is something else in us. And I found a more or less scientific way to, yeah, to, not to prove that, but to work with it. And in particular, people that are dealing with prenatal psychologies, 
might be interested in that. And why is that? I show you a few slides in the begin uh, to start with, and because that is a Zoom technical procedure, I hope I yeah I I'm successful in showing you my first slides. www.embryo.nl that's my website where you can find everything that I'm going to tell you or everything that is uh, that I present in my courses. There are stories there, there are articles, there are PowerPoint presentations, and it's in three languages, English, German, and uh, Dutch. And this nice slide maybe is a kind of, yeah, uh, schedule for the problem I would want to face, uh, I want to talk about with you this evening introduction. And it is, what about embryo and mind? What about embryo and brain? What about brain and mind? How is that nowadays? Well, we have nowadays yeah, a kind of tsunami of brainism. And brainism is the modern way to look at our soul, our spirit. It is the assumption, it's the idea, it's the concept that our soul, our personality, our consciousness is more or less a function or something like a product of the brain. And that's not what we experience. That's not what we live every day, that we are brains, thinking, telling, talking, experiencing. No, we have bodies that can think and that with which we experience life and have all kinds of, you know, um, psychological, yeah, interactions. And the human problem actually is that we have a mind and a body. And this quote says it very clear. The human problem, having a mind and being a body, is nowhere as painful and clear as it is in medicine. Because in medicine, we become aware of it. It's painful because being a body means that you have to die. We are mortal. There's something else in us that might that might not not be the body, but that is also present as long as we live. And clearly is the problem because having a mind means you know it. I hear music on my screen. Is that correct? No? Okay. Sorry, up. Keep going. Hi, Crystal. Please. Hi, Crystal. Sorry. And yeah, where keep... is that twofold just coming from? Why do we have such a problem about body and mind? And why are people constantly discussing with each other? We do not have a mind. We do not have a soul. Or is it soul and body? And what has soul to do with body? Well, that has simply to do with something that we experience in ourselves. We do not think that we are souls or minds, but we experience like Descartes, like Plato, that there must be something else in our body. And that something else you can give different names. You can call it your mind, you can call it your, brain, your, your soul, your spirit, but there is something else. And in, I found a method to work with that. And that simple message is, the simple message to that is that if spirit exists, suppose there is something in our body that is not the body, but another dimension in ourselves. Suppose if spirit exists, you know one thing for sure, and that's what Descartes tried to tell us, you know one thing for sure, it must be, it has to be, it cannot be something else than the absolute and complete polarity of matter, of the body. Because if our mind, our soul, our spirit, was similar or identical with the body, we could be aware of it. And that is one of my dogmas, so to say. You can only be aware of something if you are separated, uh, discriminated from it. If there is a soul in us, if there is a so-called imponderable dimension that you cannot measure, that you cannot make visible with a microscope, of which you cannot make a brain scan, then it must be the complete polarity of. 
And that is my biology. That is how I approached the embryo in a way to look for a deep polarity in the human body that might be related to mind. And that is why I uh, sometimes, that's why I always emphasize to people when I, when I talk about the body, I'm not talking only about it as the anatomist. I'm also an anatomist. But I also talk about the body as the dimension that we all can experience. But how do you get those two together? Because they two cannot be come together. Because the body that we have, the body of science with all the muscles and the brains, is a complete different reality as the body that you are, that you experience. And there are many words for that. In philosophy, we talk, for example, about the first person reality and the second person reality. Two bodies, the body that you are, the body that you have. What is a first person reality? Well, that's the body that you are, so to say, every single day of your life. There is that reality in you that you can experience as Jaap van der Waal or who is thinking or what is thinking in me. And David Lesondag says it's quite clear. Um, he says, without a body, there's nothing to perceive. And without perception, there is, sorry, I cannot read my own slide. Um, so mind and body are not a split. That's what so many people see because it's a duality. They think it's a split. And in a way, it is split because mind must be completely different opposite polarity of body. But on the same time, they are one. And that is my, let's say, my policy to search for spirit in the body. Body and mind are one, also in the embryo. But how come that I was, uh, uh, yeah, so to say, confronted with um, the embryo and the question of the mind in the embryo? This is, um, that has to do with um, that I met prenatal psychology. It was already in the 90s of the last centuries that prenatal psychologists came to me and asked me, well, we are dealing with prenatal psychology and we think that embryos and fetuses have experiences and can, uh, yeah, can need difficulties in their development that are on the psychological level. But how is that? How can that be if there is not a brain? And that is a problem for the embryo because there is all these six weeks in the beginning and all the six months in the beginning. There's not a functional brain in an embryo and a fetus. So how can it be that there is mind functioning or that there is experience or perception? How can that be? That was the question that they confronted me with. And that question is similar for nowadays, let's say, the main part of your body. Because many people nowadays say, well, okay, mind, mind, that is brain, that is my perception, that is my consciousness, my awareness. But how about the rest of your body? Well, modern brain physiologists have an answer to that. For example, um, Professor Schwab, he's a very famous um, uh, Dutch uh, neurophysiologist, neuroanatomist. He says, well, the body has only three functions. The body serves the nutrition, the locomotion, and the reproduction of the brain. And many people think like that, as if the head, the brain, is something else, and that the body somewhere starts here. So still, they also seem to deal or to look for a kind of duality. Apparently, you live in a different way in your head as you live in the rest of your body because, yeah, the body serves the locomotion, the nutrition, and reproduction of the brain. That's all. And Schwab also says, I will go back to the slides, Schwab also says something else. He says that the body, that the brain is like a kidney. Um, like a kidney produces urine, so the brain produces consciousness. 
Have you ever seen a kitten produce water, produce urine? I've never seen that because the urine does not come out of the kidney or is not produced by the kidney. No, the kidney transforms a main part of our body fluids to urine and uses that for a kind of important process for your body function. So how can it be that a ponderable organ like the brain, which is anatomy with its physiology, you can make a scan of its function. How can it be that it would produce something imponderable as my soul, my mind, my personality? Because don't forget that. They might ever, there might come a day that they can read your thoughts, but they will never be able to think your thoughts. Your mind is a private, unique, body-linked, imponderable, unexperienceable for someone else um, dimension. Maybe we could go back to, with, to the slide with Rumi. Rumi says, Rumi is that is philosophy of the 13th century. Rumi says, study me as much as you like. You will not know me. For I differ in a hundred ways from what you see me to be. Put yourself behind my eyes and see me as I see myself. For I have chosen to dwell in a place you cannot see. And that is the problem with research on the mind. We have got to be in the scientific body that we have described, that we describe in our anatomy books, in our physiology book. That's the object body. That's a third person body. That's the reality which we can observe and think about. But the reality that we experience and that we live and that we, uh, yeah, that, that, that primary, that first person reality, cannot be seen or observed by anyone else. You are the only one who knows who it is to think in this body or to have pain in this body. So if mind exists, I have to search for it in the primary body, in the first person. Realm. So it can never be found in the scientific body because that's another dimension in which particularly, in particular, the mind, the imponderable dimension has been thought away. So that is the problem. It is not me. It is not my brain and my body. It is me and my body. It's not my brain and the world. It is me and the world. So in all dimensions, everywhere in my body, there must be something like mind or soul. So what to do? in an embryo, because in the embryo, there is no brain yet. And even in the, in the fetus, we can see a first functioning of, of, of brain maybe. And even there is the question, look at this slide. At the most, the fetus is a kind of mini human being with phenomena related to something like psyche and awareness. But the embryo, how could that be? It's brainless. Is it a brain dead being? What are we doing when we're embryo? Is the embryo in us? Is that a past? Once, long ago, first nine weeks of my life? Or is maybe the embryo in the actuality? If I can find mind, consciousness in the embryo also, I might be able to demonstrate mind consciousness, soul, in that part of my body in which I live now as an unconscious being. So how could we deal with an embryo? How could we understand? And when I met, um, when I met for the first time prenatal psychology, it was, uh, it was by the words of Ronald Lane. He was a London psychiatrist, and he was one of the first, let's say, prenatal psychiatrists. And he asked me, so to say, the most important questions. And he had an hypothesis. He had an idea that our embryonic or 
fruit fetal life is body life, but that it also might be a way of soul to be. And what was his quote that struck me the most? Is it possible for we cells, before and after especially neural tissues arise, to reproduce in later phases of the life cycle, transforms or variation of our first experiences? He supposes that we are experiencing when we are an embryo. May our prenatal experiential patterns function as templates for some of our patterns woven into the complex knit of postnatal design. Is it about patterns? So then comes the question, what do we do when we are an embryo? To watch the adult, you can see that spirit or soul might be present there because the, the, the adult person talks and writes books and loves his wife. You know, there's much expression of soul in adults, but how is that an embryo? And then I came to a very important discovery. And that is that our body is not, let's say, only body. Body in the sense that it is an anatomical uh, spatial structure. No, our so, body is a pro process. Our body appears like every living being in time. And here you see it. Here you see a movie which demonstrates you what we are doing when we are an embryo. What are we doing? Growing. What are we doing? Moving. What are we doing? Performing a body. This movie only goes from the period from the fourth week till the 14th week. But you can loud and clearly you can see that our body is a motion, a movement, a process. And this process, dear people, never ends, never stops. It stops when you die. That means that your body is not an anatomy, is not a spatiality or a spatial structure. It's not only body, there's also time. It's a process. That is why our body simply cannot be a computer, it cannot be a pump, because Pumps and computers are machines. And machines, yes, machines are made, built up from elements, from chips and parts. And then out of that whole comes a complete machine. And that starts to function as a computer or as a pump. So not a living being. A living being is never ready. A living being is always on the move is always on process. And that is typical for every living organisms. They appear in time. So there comes never a moment that you can say, oh, now the body is ready. Now it starts to function and to write books or whatever, or to become Jaap van der Waal. No, no, there is not such a moment. You are a creature of body and mind, soul and body from the very beginning on. But apparently, there are two ways of being a body. Apparently, there are two ways of being mind in a body. And the embryo shows you the first way to be a mind in a body. And that is that we could hypothesize or we could figure, think that who or what is shaping this body. That is the embryo, the human being, the organism itself. A living organism is, that comes a very important word, autopoiesis. Here is the slide that is connected with that. Autopoiesis. It shapes itself, it performs itself. Here's a quote. We just need to thoughtfully follow the process itself. And then we see everywhere in the organic life being at work. And once we realize that the activity nature of a developing organism is also a 
we can see that the mature organism also is a being of work. Organisms are never ready and then start to function. They have already to function when they are shaping, when they are performing, when they are auto policing themselves. So that means that already in the very beginning on, your mind, your mind body entity is performing active autopoietic itself. We are not machines, we cannot be machines. And you don't need something. Uh, yeah, special like, uh, yeah, that must be that there is a spirit. No, spirit and body in living organisms, soul and body are one. They belong to each other, mind and body are one. And that might help us to understand this quote or this question or this hypothesis of uh, 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 Ronald Lay, because what are we doing when we are an embryo? We are doing the same thing as we are doing now. You never stop with being an embryo. And what are you doing? The first thing you do every day, every second of your life is performing, shaping, maintaining your body. And that is also an activity of you as being a being of spirit and matter of mind and body. So in your body, there is something else active, performing. And how can you understand that? Well, the embryo is making gestures, is my opinion. The embryo performs behavior. Your shaping of your body is behavior. And of course, human behavior is different from the behavior of a rat. Of course, we will have different souls. Of course, we have different minds, rats and humans. And the secret is that in principle, you start to be a mind in the body, performing, shaping your body as an act of the soul. But then something happens, something extra comes in. Another way of being mind. Here you see a schedule that tries to tell you how I see let's say the polarity or the, yeah, the polarity of embryo versus adult. In the adult, you could say you have your body and it is your instrument for your mind, for your soul to express itself. With your body, you do your things. With your body, you want your thing. You need your body, your brain to, to think, to be aware and to act and to do and to write your books. So the body as an instrument of the soul, but how do you reach that? Well, then you have to reach your body and bring your body in a kind of state that you no longer are, you know, involved in the body in shaping and growing it, but then your soul can become more or less free from the body. And then you start to express in what you do, what you say, what you perform, you know, your soul life in the world and you express yourself in the world. So for me, in this schedule, the adult lives in a centripetal way. We use our body to express ourselves. Our orientation as adult beings is the world. And the body is the instrument for my soul, my mind to reach that world and to make itself knowable to the world. So not an embryo. An embryo cannot do that. An embryo cannot live in its body yet, because the body is not there yet. It's still performing itself. Where does an embryo live? Where do you nowadays live? Not in your brain. You live in your, in your viscera, in your lungs, in your heart, in your liver. The embryo lives in its placenta. That's where the embryo is rooting. There you exist, there you breathe. There you digest, there you yeah, perform all those processes that you now are performing with this body that's now watching you up from the wall. So an embryo lives in the opposite way. It lives centripetal. And the aim of its existence is the body itself. That is the body shaping soul in you. And now there comes a very dramatic yeah, moment. I found out 
that in your body from the very beginning, the first day on, the main important gesture of development that an embryo is making is this. I will switch off the slide. Every time you will see in the embryo, in every developing organism, in every living being, it happens that out of the one, there comes the two. And the two very often is a polarity. And the polarity means complete opposition, but also being connected with each other. A polarity cannot be without each other. They are one. So every time we see out of the one, that polarizes a two. And the two creates in between, in the body, a domain where, so to say, the being can live and can exist. So is that maybe the polarity I'm looking for? That there are two ways to be in your body or to be with your body. On the one hand, you are embodying. You are creating, forming, shaping that body. And you never stop with that. On the other hand, there comes organs, there comes tissues, there come muscles, brains, domains where the growing and the formation and the shaping stops. Not completely, because if it stopped, it would die. But it comes to form, to structure. It becomes nearly dead. And then you see in these organs, in these tissues, awareness, consciousness coming up. Your eyes, your brains. Isn't it surprising that what we nowadays so much appreciate in our being, our consciousness, our soul, our mind, that it can only become functional and awareness if life withdraws. When the shaping and the motion and the movement stop, then your soul can come free. And in your thoughts, in your emotions, in your willing life, it comes to expression on the psychological level. That's fantastic if that is true. And the nice thing is that recently um, there were two books have appeared and I will show you the titles and the authors. Two books have appeared. And the, the first one is Thomas Verney. He's the classical prenatal psychologist. Classical prenatal psychologist looks for the soul in the body and looks for soul in the embryo in the fetus. And in this book, he thinks he has found that. He has found the embodied mind. And then he comes to a very important conclusion that my mind is not only located or functioning in the brain, but that the whole body is mind. That the whole body has levels of awareness and there are organs in which you sleep, there are organs in which you dream, there are organs in which you awake, but there is, you know, there are levels of organs where you come aware. And he talked about, he talks about the embodied mind, the mind that has settled itself in the body. And that's where the scars are, that's where the traumas are, that and it's where Bessel van der Kolk is talking about. You know, in the body, there might some some experiences in your prenatal life get stuck and cause scares or problems or difficulties. That is the typical embodied mind concept. The other book, however, is from Kiriana Mensa. She's the spouse of Franklin Sill. And she, and if you read the book, you'll see there's a lot of Jaap van der Wall in the book. She takes that other dimension that there's also spirit trying to embody itself. Verne is talking about the embodied mind. The mind that has been successful in shaping itself organs to function with. But she talks about that continuous lifelong activity of your mind, of your soul, of your spirit to embody, to organize, to maintain. And that means that she makes in the book quite clear, we are not somewhere on the way becoming a being of soul and body. We are soul and body, mind and body from the very beginning on. It is not philosophically logical. It's also not biological logical to presume 
that we come from this body, it is not very logical to think that, because that means that there must be a moment in which the embryo, in which the body, in which the human being starts to have a soul. That's what so many people ask me. When is the soul coming in? And that's why many people consider the embryo and the fetus as not yet ready. In a living organism, there's never a moment that you are not ready yet. You're always ready from the very beginning on because your readiness, your being is becoming. A living organism, also the human beings, do not get a soul on the way. It's not uh, at the third week or the third month or at birth or after seven years that your soul comes in or that your brain starts to produce a mind, a consciousness. No, mind is from the very beginning on an activity that shapes, performs your body and can come free, so to say, and become your personal mind, your psychological mind. That's quite a different idea. And then you see the famous Bessel van der Kolk. I heard him already three times. And it's amazing. The guy is fantastic. If you have him, if he shows his videos when he works with patients, with people that have deep, deep traumas in their prenatal or perinatal life. And he works with them with all kinds of methodologies like uh, family settings. But the first half of his lecture, what? The first three quarter of his lectures are always about the brain. And he tells you which, in which nuclei and in which centers are connected with what and where the fault of brain is working and uh, inhibiting or whatever. But then he shows how to work with that, with the traumas, with the, the problems that come up during development. Well, then he uses the old fashioned social psychological method and all the methods of brain. But the risk is that if we more and more start to think that we can explain all our psychological, yeah, let's say, uh, the, the problems or, or functions by a brain, then there might be uh, a future coming up in which we start to manipulate the brain in order to manipulate our soul. And I don't know if that's the way to go. So the body keeps the score, he says. But the nice thing is that he always talks about mind, brain, and body. You see, Bessel doesn't know the way so well in the body. He's still doubting, is it body? And is the brain a special part of my body? And how about the mind? Is there only mind in the brain? And is there, only, is there also mind in the body? And Verney is clear about that. There's so, certainly mind in the body. But he considers the body as a giant brain. Gary on a mansion and Jaap van der Waal consider the body also as a giant mind in the sense of the shaping performance of your body. I hope that I am able to, uh, in these very condensed 40 minutes, have been able to present you the, the central issue of my message, of my embryology, of my human biology, because this has, of course, to do with human biology. So could, could I conclude with something? Yeah, why not? Um, uh, I might conclude with a very embarrassing uh, meeting I had this morning with modern biology. In the paper in Holland, there was an article about how far we are nowadays in creating human embryos. And they are far. They are so far that they nowadays have to stop with creating their artificial embryos at a third week because it's in modern ethics, it's not allowed to deal with embryos, human embryos older than three weeks. But I was, I was not only embarrassed, I was, I was deeply, deeply worried about this because what was the main debate in the article? What is the main debate that these people have? Are these artificial embryos, are they human, yes or no? And what was the main argument they took to prove that these human embryos are, these artificial human embryos are embryos? Homology, looking alike. There seems to be in biology a law 
or, and they call it the duck law. And the duck law is very simple. If it looks like a duck, if it makes sound like a duck, duck, if it behaves like a duck, then it's a duck. So if we are now making embryos that look like human embryos, and they find that an argument to consider these embryos as real human embryos, we are going a very false path. Then we are thinking, then we are bringing into practice that we are simply the product of our bodies. And that is what I hope will not happen. But it was so embarrassing this morning to, they, they use the homology argument. You know, my embryology, I tell people this in my embryology course, and then I, and then I quit, Kate, sorry for the taking too much time. I show you what I show my, my, my people, the people in my course about homology. Homology is a very old fashioned biological argument to prove that things are the same. When I show these figures to my students, to my public, the first thing they say, this proves that we are animals because the human embryos look like an animal. That's homology. That is looking alike. That our heart looks like a pump doesn't make it a pump. That our brain functions as a computer doesn't make our brain a computer. A brain cannot be a computer. We don't have a, we don't have a hard disk. And even Verney tries to make a whole body and hard disk, but we do not have an anatomical structural hard disk because we are a process. We are checked every morning you wake up with a new computer in your head. 100,000 new synapses are made. Do you really want to think that this brain can function as a computer? Yes, it might function as a computer, but it is not a computer. What does everyone say when they see these pictures? Well, that proves that we are, that we are animals that we stem from the animal. That is homology, looking alike. But it always corrected my students. You cannot say that here human embryos look like animals. You could also say that animals look like human embryos. Yes, but that's not true. Because Darwin said that we come from the apes and the apes come from the animals. So the animals were first and then we came. If you come to my course, I will show you that you are in your body from the first day on. It's not a given moment after three weeks or three months or three years that you become, that you are, that before that you are not yet. You are, you are yourself, you are your embryo, you are your body from the very beginning on. So behind that development of your body, there's mind. How you show, how you look like, how you develop, how you shape yourself is an expression of the mind. Could it be that evolution is not a development that produced us, but evolution is our biography? And that animals and humans are together and they are our, each other relatives, not because we are animals, but because everything around us has to do with the human being. But that goes so far that I will not tell you that in my second day webinar I'm going to give with uh, Kate about prenatal consciousness. I have here a paper and everything that I wrote on this, I did not tell you. It just came up as a flow of words to say. So I hope you have something. There's time for questions, isn't it, Kate? Yes. There's time. Thank you, Jaap van der Waal. It's always wonderful to listen to your ideas and things that you are thinking and the ways you apply it to our lives as embryo, as humans, as bodies and minds and spirits. Um, so far, we have one question from oh. Bob, Bob Lenberg. So far, Jaap, give people a chance, Jaap. Um, we have Bob who says, I've heard Yap say that in development, the embryo knows where it's going. It has a direction to develop. How does it know? Because it has a body, because it is a spirit. Because, because it is a mind. Because it is a body, 
every organism is a autopoietic entity of mind and body, a time body, we call it etheric body or a physical body, but it is not the cells that know, it's not your genes that know, it's the organism that orchestrates the genes. It's the organism that wires the brain. It's the organism that organizes the cells. So there's only one answer. How do they know? How does an organism know where to go to and how to become a lion, how to become a tadpole? Because a tadpole is already a frog. Don't consider a tadpole not to be a frog yet. No, a tadpole also is a frog on the way to be a frog. Living beings are becomings, not beings. So the answer to that question is who or why or where do you know that? Yeah, in your soul, in your mind, in the organism, spirit, in spirit of the organ that knows where to go to. Is that an answer? Yeah, Bob, is that enough of an answer for you? Yeah, it helps. And um, I'm, I'm still keeping it in the field. <laughs> okay, thank, good. Yeah, the field, you, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it's you. certainly not in your brains and it's no. certainly not in your genes. And that's what I do not like so much on the Bernie hypothesis. He locates mind, he locates all these functions in the cells or in organs. No, spirit, mind happens on or by means of my body. My body is a condition for me as living organism to make myself, yeah, uh, doable, <laughs> the right words. Sorry. That's, that's good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. And so uh, Jeremiah likes to know if that little video you showed is online. And I think, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, you, yeah. you create, I mean, you gave us a lot, a lot of little videos and that I yeah. think they're part of the package and they're, they're in on your website. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the, the PowerPoint, I make a PDF of, of course, the film does not function, but the films are uh, on the website. And when you follow a course, you get the whole package of all my animations and all my articles and everything that I wrote and published, but it's on my website. You go to, um, I have a new website since short, and you go to um, teaching material, and then you go to videos, and there you'll find so many animations amongst other this one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So let's see. Um, could, you, uh, could you follow me, Rita? Rita? Yeah. <laughs> could you follow my poor English? I have to... Um, yeah, your English is not poor, Jaap. It's great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. It's okay. true. You understand yeah. everything. So no problem, Jaap. And um, okay. I'm enjoying your speeches always. I've attended four days of Yap in Almelo, which I was really touched. And we exchanged also some experiences. And uh, thank I you Yap, for being you. Yeah. Thank you for being you. I very often hear that from people that attend my yes. courses. Okay. That it's so, life changes. And I'm very grateful for that. Yes. And um, yeah. Yes. So keep you, you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Other oh, questions? Um, okay, so Marina Farrell asks, because the embryo and the placenta are attached to the mother being, do they share a consciousness preconception or are they totally separate always? Curious is how it relates to intergenerational trauma. You have to repeat it but it, because I didn't fully get it. Because the embryo... Sir Kate White. Because the embryo and the placenta are attached to the mother, do they share a consciousness preconception? Of course, they share consciousness with each other, but not via the placenta. I mean, the mother child contact in the beginning is, let's say, via the path of biology. I'm convinced that it's far more important for the mother, for the child, what the mother is eating and drinking and not smoking, than that she's playing songs or playing good music for her. I mean, your physical state, your 
health state, your biological state is for you as a maternal organism, the major important thing for the, for the embryo. So if there is discommunication, it is often in the biological processes that might go wrong. And that might of course lead to psychological disorders or fractures, but it's not that via the placenta, it is just simply via the minds, via the spiritual uh, beings that mother and child are. Of course, there is contact, but it is not, let's say, uh, not yet a psychological contact that you can have later on with your child or with your fetus. That's my view. It's your unconscious. Uh, it's, it's on the unconscious level that things still happen in the embryo. Later in the fetus, there comes something like psychological contact. That's why I show that everything you can perform psychologically, every gesture that you can make psychologically later on first has to be pre-exercised in forms. Blechnit is loud and clear about his view. In the embryo, soul is not something that comes in later on, no. You are from the beginning on you are a being of soul and body and soul is pre-exercised in the body. So first you communicate with the world by means of your morphological gestures, your morphological uh, 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 processes. And later on, you will repeat or will be able to repeat the same gestures physiologically. And then comes psychology. Also, you know, an embryo has to nest. What is nesting? Contact, connecting, a deeply deep way of connection that you have to first do in a biological way. And mother can play nice songs for you, but if she smokes uh, 10 cigarettes per day, the biological connection will be this, this um, disabled. And then comes physiological communication, then comes physiological expression, and then comes psychological expression. In the short movie I showed you, you could see that an embryo makes all kinds of gestures and movements that later on will be repeated by the child physiologically. For example, coming upright. When the child comes upright for the first time and stands on its own feet, and you can feel the joy of the child recognizing itself as an independent being, that is not the first time, it's the second time. And later on, the child will again stand up and against you and say, father, I don't want to be a priest. I will become a medical doctor. And there's the psychological coming up right. So psychology gestures are pre-exercised. It's physiological gestures are pre-exercised as morphological gestures. Your body is behavior. And most of the disorders that come up in early prenatal life have to do with the biological communication and gestures that you are performing in yourself and with your mother. Clear? I never ask if you agree with me. <laughs> I always ask, do you understand? Yes. yes, thank you. Are you ready for another question, Yap van der Waal? Well, it depends on, uh, yeah, five minutes left. Okay. I see Marian Apostle says, uh, I do have a question. Is it the fluid body, a concept of Dr. Jealous, responsible for embryo development and growing? Yeah. The, fl the fluid body. Yeah, the fluid body or the etheric body that are just um, giving names or definition to the, let's say, non-ponderable organization level of the organism. I mean, an organism is is absolutely a non, um, how do you call it, a non, Goethe would call it a non-visible or non-perceivable uh, entity. I mean, your soul, but also your organism, your wholeness is not something that you can see or is, is not something that is ponderable. And that life that Dr. Jealous was talking about is therefore already a super sensible dimension. Every organism has it. It is, a, it is the whole, the organism um, itself on the on already spiritual dimension, and it's expressed in the fluid body. And nowadays we have Gerald Pollack. Don't forget that. Gerald Pollack is the genius that discovered that all the water 
in your body is organized. And that primary to the anatomical, physical organization of your body, there is the organization of water. Water is not only liquid. Water has two polarity. There's the liquid water, the flowing water, the stream, the waters of the, where the soul is living, like Andrew Taylor still said, and there's the structure water, the form water. And you have to imagine that your fluid body is, if you think away, Everything in your body that is matter, the cell membranes, the nuclei, all the particles in the cell, all the walls of your vit, all think it all away. And then still you could see the shape of the body because the water has adapted, the cytoplasm water, the interstitial water has adapted its space, its organization completely to the physical body. And that is also where the embryo organizes its body. In that fluid body, there it organizes, orchestrates its cells. There are the fields, and the fields are not anatomical entities. It are super sensible, organizing spiritual mind dimensions. There is no other way. Either we are two, or we are one. And if we are one, everything comes from the brain, everything comes from the genes. But genes and brains cannot be active principles. They are conditions necessary conditions, but not sufficient conditions to form a body, to perform an organism. Amen. <laughs> that, yeah, that are my genes, you know, my father was always, was a kind of priest in the church, and he was also so absolute, he could talk so absolute, but I do not want to talk in an absolute way, I never ask if you agree with it, but can you understand it? I have to think in two. There is no other way. Okay. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you. Amen. Yeah. Hi, Crystal. Thank you for being there. So one more question, Yap van der Waal. Yeah. Two minutes left. Two minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. It says from Sophie. She says you seem to equate mind with soul. Are yeah, they the no, same? No, 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 no. Yeah, for the moment, for the moment, yes. But um, uh, let's say I can show that on a slide. Very simple. That's always the question: What is job? What is mind? What is soul? And what is spirit? Uh, I look for the slide. Just a moment. And Taylor still said, we are mind, motion, matter. Here's the slide. Um, share, yeah, share. Here it comes. Here's the slide. And Taylor still, mind, motion, matter. He uses mind two centuries ago in the old fashioned way. Mind in those times were, was a terminology uh, similar to spirit. And I told you with spirit, we mean the dimension that is completely the non-body dimension. If spirit exists, it must be the complete polarity, absolute difference from body. So mind matter, mind body is the big, let's say, polarity. And when mind and body comes together and how you do that, I could tell you in my courses, it happens at conception. Then soul comes in. Then soul appears. Jaap van der Wal is my soul. And my soul is a psychosomatic dimension. My soul is as well, so to say, uh, determined or whatever by my spiritual core, but also my body, my genes, my brains are conditions. And together, you know, the, harm, the, the dialogue between my spiritual dimension, my eternal dimension, and the matter of the body, the genes and the brains, that is appearing as soul. So for me, it is spirit, as the eternal non-body spiritual dimension that might, you know, be eternal. And then the body, the matter, and in between, in interaction, there appears soul and that is Jaap van der Waal. So Jaap van der Waal will not incarnate, will not reincarnate. That's what people always say. Oh, you believe in, you believe in spirit, so do you believe in reincarnation? Yes, I believe in reincarnation, it's a good option, but Jaap van der Waal cannot reincarnate. Yeah, from the wall is as how my spirit now appears by means of this body 
in, if there would come another moment for me to incarnate in a body, then I would be, I would even not recognize myself anymore because I will be a completely different being. That's my idea about spirit, soul, and whereas mind, in America, the mind is somewhere between, let's say, soul and body. Because they consider the brain, uh, the mind, that is what you think, your, your, your mentality, that is a kind of dimension which is above your astral or your emotional body, your animal soul. And the mind is, let's say, where you think with that it's your, that's a very low grade uh, description of mind. Mind is nearly synonymous with brain. But the old fashioned meaning of mind was spirit. Spirit, man is mind, motion, matter. You could say man is spirit, soul, and body. Is that an answer? Yes. Do you understand best. me? Do you yes. understand me? Yes, it's excellent. Me? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, no, we have reached. No, minute, no minutes left. No minutes but left. One question. Okay. Uh, one so. Question. You want to do another question, Yap? What? You're, we've all done with questions? You're all done. Or do you want more questions? Do you know that I talked with Gerald Pollock three days ago? Oh, good. Two days ago, I talked via Zoom about muscles. Because his water theory is about that water can be the formless liquid can be the formed structure. And that's a polarity. That's polarity also described in my lecture. There is processing, there is shaping, there's time. But some at some organs, there comes anatomy, death, structure, and their consciousness wakes up. And that is the water he brings. He brings the water in enormous. He, he said two days ago, yeah, that means that if we die, the structure water, the fourth phase of water in my organism becomes liquid. And that's exactly what happens with the corpse. It, it becomes liquid. So I saw the polarity of form and liquids of structure and process. And then he started to talk about muscles. And I had to correct him because he's not a real human biologist. He comes from physics. He comes from water, hydrology or whatever. And he started to talk about the muscles as contractile organs and contractile tissues and the contraction theory of the filaments. I said, dear Gerald, I, I, you are genius and you gave me so much with your theory of water. And now you talk about muscles as contractile organs. That's the most fatal error you made about muscles. Muscles are not contractile organs. Muscles are rhythm organs and they can contract and become stiff and hard and fast, fist, uh, st uh, stiff, or they can relax and they become liquid and form. That is the polarity in between muscles work. They do not contract. And then he said, wow, mm, that's maybe a way to look at it. I said, you have to look at it because this would, this would be in harmony with your theory of what? Well, he's a good guy. So have nice talks with him. Read his book, it's, it's genius. It's really genius to make that simple discovery that the water in living organism is the organizing water. Fantastic. 